Hello, me homies. How you all doing? Come on. You fired up? You excited? If you guys haven't watched our uh, Living Waters video, the My Water Cure video, come on. Go check it out, man. It was so good. My wife just crushed it. Crushed it. That was like literally years in the making. We feel like there's been a few. This is a War of the Ages episode, so get ready to gear on for some cosmic warfare. Oh, what the? I just found like an area I'm going to be able to plunge and immerse in. It's like, yes, there's lots of private properties around here, but I'm navigating my way through them. <laughs> Anyways, hey, I'm just so fired up. We have literally been recording and documenting and wanting to do that video on my water cure for years. Like that, all that stuff kind of started. There's footage and clips in there that are, I don't know, four or five years. Like we don't, we don't use lots of other random people's like stock footage stuff. You know, we don't like edit and use AI software to come in and grab clips from the internet and all this other stuff. We just, we like to go out and live the adventure and then film it ourselves and B roll that in. <laughs> I'm ready to go shark tooth hunting and fossil hunting. Thankfully, I brought my treasure kit. It's finally upgraded, y'all. Now I can breathe underwater. <laughs> but I still got my gargoyle and snorkel. As you can see, the water is... Oh, my! Don't mind me. As you can see, the water is super not ideal conditions for any of the things we're about to do. No. Which is great because I have tremendous faith in the creator of the treasures of the sea. So I'm going to go down there and find those treasures. You can find them anywhere you look. If you're willing to be brave and do what other people are super uncomfortable doing. Like reading the scriptures. Read the Sword of the Covenant. Read Deuteronomy 31 and 32. Treasures hidden in the sea. A nature night! I'll catch you later! She just crushes it with her editing stuff that took like, I don't know, 50, 60 hours. Took months <laughs> on mom's schedule. You know what I'm talking about, ladies. Vibrant ladies. Come on. You know what I'm saying. But we are so fired up to get that out there. We feel like that. Like the living water cure is so good. I'm going to launch off this week. I'll give you a sneak peek. I've been going back through this book, The Invisible Rainbow. I highly recommend you guys get this one if you haven't. Tuck it away because I'm going to do a bunch of reading through it. I've got this, the well, really my second time reading all the way through it and probably third or fourth time just scanning through it. But I am going to do like an actual series on this book because it's just, it's, it's cracking open so many areas about how physiologically we work, how creation works and how the body that we have been given functions. And uh, anyways, in electric dragons are on their way. We're going to have to hit that one up, but I'm so pumped to go through it. And we're going to talk about porphyrins, porphyrins and mitochondria, myelin sheaths and the electric fluids and liquid crystals and semiconductors in your protein muscles and all the ways of crazy stuff that's happening inside your body. And I'm just fired up. Anyways, I'm a little too excited right now. I went on a little adventure with my guy, my thunderous son, Abraham. We went exploring in the woods yes. and I found my, one of my favorite plants in the entire world that I haven't seen in a long time. I'm just like beyond enthused. You can expect a little video coming out about that later on. But before that, I just want to talk to you about some character. I can't get too excited. I'm going to wake everybody up. It's a little different. Sometimes when I have like a, a studio with chambers separating me from my family, I can get real loud and enthused like I was in that video. Chelsea and I were like, oh, it's late night and we were all hopped up on sleep deprivation and we were just, we were in rare form right then, but right now I'm just hopped up on pure other level excitement. So let's go. Sometimes when I find treasures, I'm like, just, I can't even tell you. I love treasure hunting. Oh my gosh. Whoa. Whoa. This is how I feel when I get to the beach. Yes. Beach. Ocean. Pelicans. Waves. Sunrise. Oh, sunrise. <laughs> There's not even that many waves. We are in for it today. It's gonna be so good. I can't even describe to you the elation in my soul. But I feel it. In my toes. Woo! It's all the way down into my toes because I can feel it. It's exciting. You know why? I'm going scuba diving at the beach today. Yes! Ultimate awesome ever. I can see the moon. I can even see the blue through the moon. Which is peculiar. What does that mean? Quandary to you. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going in the water. I'm gonna take a GoPro so you can see what I see. Yes! Woo! hunting so much and uh i was I, I go out almost always i'll just be super transparent 
I go out looking for staffs. That's like one of my favorite things to go into the forest to do. I like to look for very shaded, like if you can find a mature forest that's got trees that are that are that have developed a shade covering like when you have a really heavily shaded forest underneath in the understory you can have saplings that are 30 40 50 years old and they're like an inch in diameter and so you can get these very very dense woody trees in particular i'm almost always like my main ones i look for is hickory hickory in particular because it's very tough it's very abrasion you can knock the heck out of stuff it's what they make axe handles with that's what they make like baseball bats with right it's really tough and you take a thrashing and um you know i'm always on the imminent readiness for battling wolves and dogs with my staffs so i'm always on the hunt for that stuff so i always just go out i take a handsaw i have like a silky saw i have also like a little folding saw that's my favorite and one of my machetes and i just I look for staffs. I just look for really straight pieces of those wood of those trees grown out there. But it leads me on all kinds of little adventures. I just like to get an excuse to go into the forest to find stuff. And I found just awesome treasure today. And I was just, I just felt loved on. I just felt loved on. My creator just gave me a big hug. The forest it was great. Some of us are very wild. I'm just, I'm a wild kind of human. I, I much prefer the outside in that in that regard. And uh, I ate mushrooms that I found out there. Cooked them up. Just ate them. So if I'm a little sprigly, that's why. <laughs> They're not that kind of mushrooms, you guys. I don't play in those games. You know what I'm saying? Be sober. Be vigilant. Want to read it? Let's do it. Second Peter. Let's go there. First Peter. Challenge you to a sword fight. Let's go. Let's go, son. Let's get there. Let's get there. Chapter five. Come on. Fire off, Peter. My wife and I read this book together the other day. Shabbat Shalom. Time to snuggle. and Read the book of Peter. What's up, hey? Um, I definitely want some. Will you bring me a turmeric tea latte or whatever mom called it? Turmeric latte, turmeric ginger latte. You bet. Thanks. That's exciting. My wife's getting all kinds of rowdy. We're doing like a super intense, like diet right now. We're trying to, we're desperately trying to heal her. And, uh, we are adamantly trying to weed out anything that's causing massive histamine responses, mast cell activation, all this other stuff that's going on with her. So She's getting all kinds of funky with stuff that's going on in the kitchen right now. I'm all down. I'm down. I like it. I like her style. Anyways, my wife and I got to read First Peter this week, and I was just like, this is so good. First Peter, chapter five. You ready? Therefore, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Messiah, and also a sharer of the esteem that is to be revealed, I appeal to the elders among you, shepherd the flock of Elohim, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but voluntarily, not out of greed for filthy gain, but eagerly, neither as being masters over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you shall receive the never fading crown of esteem. In the same way, you younger ones, be subject to elders and gird yourselves with humility toward one another. For Elohim resists the proud, but gives favor to the humble. Now, hang on here a second, because we're going to use this word gird. You ever heard that? We call our car Gertie. We did, our old car at least. We call it Gertie. Gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up your loins. Now, the full disclosure, we don't wear clothing that requires girding, do we? This is this is contextually very helpful moment in your life, okay? If you haven't worn a robe, right? This, this doesn't really make any sense to you. But when you had to gird your loins, what happened was your robe, it's like running in a skirt or a dress. It's not really feasible, right? But if you needed like, we're going to go to war, son, right now. Like, my gosh, the Philistines are coming. The Philistines are coming, right? Gird up your loins, men. Let us go forth. So, but you're wearing these robes, right? These fantastic, incredible, colorful linen robes because they are incredible physique. Ferocious warrior Hebrews, right? They were ready to rock, son. And they're like, okay, you've got it. Give me my sling, honey. And then they went out to war. They would take the the front of their, like the back of their, their the the thing between their loin, their legs, right? The piece of fabric. They tuck it up into their waistband of their belt, right? And they would tuck that in. And what happened? It would hike up their clothes, and you look like you're wearing an adult diaper. I should just show you a diagram because it's gonna help. Because um, let me just show you. Let's see it. It makes you look like you're, you're, it makes you look pretty, pretty goofy. I'll just be real honest. <laughs> you look pretty silly. <laughs> All right. Check this out, you guys. But this is why I wasn't, it was, listen, people had modesty. Modest is the hottest, right? You know what I'm saying? Listen, y'all, 
Modest is the hottest. You put on that linen armor, protect you from all those cosmic rays of nightmares coming your way. You wear your linen robe. I've got a linen robe, probably, so I'll gird my loins for you guys so you get an example of this. But they, you, you're covering your legs. You're covering your body. You weren't so naked all the time. You know what I'm saying? And But when you had to gird up your loins, boy, you were a little more revealed. So let me show you. Let's get you an idea of it right here. Bam. How to gird up your loins. <laughs> the tunic wouldn't allow you to do heavy labor or fight in battle, necessitating the girding of one's loins. First, hoist the tunic up so that all the fabric is above your knees. This will give you mobility. Three, gather all the extra material in front of you so that the back of the tunic is snug against your backside. Oh, thank you. Step four, once the excess fabric is gathered in front, pull it underneath and between your legs to your rear. This feels much like a diaper. Gather half the material in each hand, bringing it back around to the front. Finally, tie your two handfuls of material together, and you're all set for battle or hard labor. Go forth. Be you men. Gird up your loins. See that? Isn't that exciting? That's a better context, isn't it? That just helps. That helps. Now you guys get a better idea of what girding your loins are. So it's like it's an intentional process. Do you see that? There was a multi-stage process in there. You were like definitively committed to that task. This wasn't just something that's like, put on your belt. It's like, I mean, that takes some time. You got you to gotta like commit to that. Yeah, but this was like modifying your entire wardrobe. You were mentally changing out of like armor into combat warrior ready to hunt you down, son. Like for me, it'd be like the hunter's coming. Prepare yourself, right? I'd be like, going to pull the battle rattle off the wall. You guys never see that stuff. Nobody does. That's the whole point of it. The hunter mode is something you like. You got to be ready to like. You're all in, totally different mindset. I'm reading Naomi a lot of these stories right now, and she's like, she's getting old enough to really get her head around war, like battle. She's like starting to really get it. Like this is a serious thing. And understanding the difference between a dad that's here at home versus a dad that's in war and fighting. It's starting to like actually make sense to her. And she's like, wow, this is this is very different. I'm like explaining to her, some dads are gone for months, years, and they never come home from war. You know, like trying to explain that paradigm to her. Because it's a reality for a lot of people right now. Like Myanmar, one of my one of my in favorite people in the entire world, Ekashai, he's from Myanmar. And right now in Myanmar, like every man and woman of military age, I think it's 18 to 35 years old, is conscripted into the military. Every one of them. Like understand, that's a very different paradigm from how most people think, when I grow up, what I'm going to do? Like be conscripted into the army. You know, like over in Ukraine right now. Like if you're a, a male, 16-ish to 60 you're going into the military. You understand like it's a, it's a completely different life that can happen so fast. And so one of the things to be able to understand for each and every one of us is the difference of mindset of when you are in condition orange. Like when you're when you are understanding that you have an adversary out there. You know, it's like you should have this kind of scale of being able to be actionable, being able to go out and be ready to like engage the adversaries when it's when it's needed, when it's necessary. You don't have to always stay in that hyper vigilance, you know, like that was one of the hard things to to, to take out of my mind was just the nonstop constant state of like being ready to fight at any given time, like especially especially coming out of the military for me. But then when Chelsea and I were like trying to come out of the cold, you know, like all the psychopaths were hunting us down and trying to murder us, you know, like I lived with firearms on my person, body armor on like multiple reloads, like tourniquets, the whole nine, man, like uh, garrotes, wire, poison pills, all of it, you know, like I was like ready for one man walking army. You know what I'm saying? Like I was ready for an extended stay, you know, gold coins, silver coins, hundred dollar bills, you know, like this stuff, you know what I'm saying, guys, you know what I'm talking about you gray men know what's up. Appreciate you guys. Stay vigilant out there. You know what I'm saying? You got your zip tie cutters. You got your handcuff keys, your tiny little saws, all that stuff for your escape and evasion. You know, that kind of stuff. I was like, never, ever not had it going. You know, one of my favorite places to stash stuff under the wristwatch, guys. Tuck that away. It's a good spot. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There's a little hide a belt out there with little cachets along the inside of your belt, places like that. You can tuck it at the back of your belt. You want to see one? I'll show you guys. Come on. Right here. Sneak break. This one. See that? There you go. This one is a is a handcuff key. You know, in case it's got double locks, you got the you got the part for sliding it open. And then that part. Now this this can go on behind your buttons. That's kind of how it's designed to be. It can go behind your buttons and uh and and just tuck on in there, right? Or you can put that under the watch, like I was telling you. Mm-hmm. 
You know, these are like little tools of the trade. You're like, I don't really need these things unless you absolutely need them. You know, of course, in case you've been illegally detained, you know, by a psychopath. You never know. But these are like little tools. And like every, every time you add one of these onto your person, you're mentally conditioning yourself to the fact that you may need to use that tool. Like if you're going out and carrying a firearm, like those of you guys that are like, I'm going to carry a firearm, gals too. You're like, I'm going to carry that thing. You need to have that girding of your loins moment in the morning. You know what I mean? Like you're putting on a potential weapon of war, right? It's, I understand. You can be like, it's just a self-defense tool. I get it. It's a tool for war warfare. Like this, this thing for me, like absolute decimating tool of warfare. You know, it's also just a tool I cut vegetables with almost 100% exclusively. It's like almost all I ever use it for. It's opening boxes, carving wood, stuff like that. However, I mentally understand the difference when I'm wearing that and when I'm not, right? Like when I'm carrying a pocket knife, like these are tools exclusively. However, they can be used for warfare immediately, right? Same thing for firearms carrying. My wife and I used to always open carry when we went hiking out in the forest. We had a lot of mountain lions. We had mountain lions stalk us, bears, stuff like that, and especially out in the Rockies. It's like we, we mentally prepared ourselves for the reality of like having to use this firearm when we're carrying it, especially if you're concealed carrying it. You know, like you, you must be absolutely all in ready, ready to utilize that thing because I always taught her the most dangerous thing in the world is a woman who has a gun and is not willing to use it, right? Or a person who carries a gun is not willing to use it. It really is. It's like you're bringing a firearm, like a very capable, deadly tool to a fight. And then if you're not really adamantly ready to completely stop somebody with that threat, that is like bringing a threat against you or the other people around you, like don't bring it out. You know what I'm saying? Like don't don't pull out a knife and threaten somebody. First of all, like you don't do that. You absolutely deploy. If you're going to deploy that thing, you use it with 100% ferocity and absolute commitment to it. I know some of you guys are total pacifists and you're like, you're, you're ready to just lay it down. I get it. I know all of these other little levels for it. Everyone's accountable for their own decision on that, right? However, these were like the, the mindset of a warrior that was required to step out the door with like my, my mind girded and ready for that encounter, ready for that moment. What it can create though is also a fatigue syndrome, right? You're burning that a little too much. If you're always quite so hyper vigilant, you're going to start to like fray on the edges a little bit. It's, it starts to get exhausting, you know, and, and especially like when I go into cities, big cities that that comes back really quickly because there's, there's an environmental factor of like living in the concrete jungle and how to navigate inside that environment that makes a very different person come crawling out of the corners of my mind. And it's necessary. It's a necessary reality, especially in areas like the cities that used to be 10, 15 years ago are completely different right now. And so like, you have to be ready for it. Like my wife and I were stopping in to go get groceries at the store and there are people shooting up heroin in the parking lot, like right there, there was other people cranking out math and you're like, geez, like right there, totally strung out of their minds, right? You got to be ready to engage that kind of stuff at a moment's notice. Now in a lot of our cities, a lot of you guys who are watching this today, like that's a normal experience for you and even for your children to encounter going out. And so having your minds prepared for those encounters and being prepared for those experiences is fundamentally what they're talking about when they say something like gird up your line, gird up your loins, gird up your mind. That's the mentality they're saying. They're saying like, listen, you're not just in some kind of regular people world. And when, when you step out the door, like you are in a cosmic war, you were in a war of the ages, right? Where we really do have these spiritual battles taking place behind the scenes that are absolutely affecting the people around us in our lives. And so when we step out the door, we need to be understanding that we are taking with us the armor. We're taking with us offensive tools, right? You're taking a sword out the door. Like this is an offensive tool. Understand that. Like this is a seriously dangerous offensive tool. Yes, you can use it for self-defense purposes only, but you can also use it to utterly destroy enemies. You really can. The sword that comes out of your mouth is extremely powerful, extremely powerful. Like we have a duty to be able to use it and wield it effectively, which means we must practice with it and train with it, which is why it requires a daily diligence, you know? And that's why I don't always encourage everybody out there to get a firearm because most people are not going to put in the commitment that's necessary to be proficient with it. If you do have one and you are not training with it, even if it's dry firing at home, even if it's just doing some of the practices and training that way, listen, you, you need to be diligent to utilize it and become proficient with it because it's a very, it's a very deadly tool when not utilized correctly, right? You're responsible for every round you fire. There's a heavy weight of, of responsibility. If you pull out a firearm, the legal ramifications of brandishing a firearm, right? If it's not absolute, you can't validate that you were more scared than you've ever been in your life, right? That there was an imminent threat to you or the people around you, right? Each state has different laws surrounding those things. There's all these complexities that come with firearms and being able to give an account 
for all these people that are going to potentially prosecute you if you pull that thing out, if every round you fire, you know, because even bad guys who are breaking in and doing all kinds of horrible stuff, they have families that might sue you, right? There's all these ramifications that come with engaging in, in combat, you know, engaging in self-defense, right? And so you got to be ready for all of those circumstances. And so don't, don't take those things on lightly, but same too with this, right? If that's just like a basic self-defense class that I wanted to teach somebody or train somebody up and I'm doing consulting, like this, this is exceedingly more dangerous of a weapon. It really is. And so if you give this to somebody and you give it to them improperly, right, or you don't warn them about the potential for great harm that can come to people's lives if they wield this without love, like we talked about before, if you can't wield this thing with love, you're going to destroy people's lives unnecessarily, right? It's good for us to bring the truth, but we have to be able to bring the truth with love, which is what the Messiah came to show us, the balance between these two things. He showed us the balance of, of how to walk these things out, how to live out the loving instructions of Yahuwah and how to love our neighbors as ourselves, like how to love Yahuwah with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and how to love our neighbors as ourselves. Like he pointed back to how we are supposed to do that. And we have in here these incredible like instructions. This book in First Peter is one of these books that should should be your daily study, like a deep study, because there's all these tidbits from a man who was at the side of the Messiah for years, like oh, maybe a year, 70 weeks. We can go into that sometime. Chronological Gospels, another interesting read by Michael Rood. Tuck that away. But this man was at his side. This man was like in his closest cabinet of best friends and so he has an insight of, of his time with the messiah and he's like at the at the heart of all of the growing beginning movements of the ecclesia right after messiah like he has such insights and precisions of understanding so when he is telling us listen gird up the loins of your mind when he is telling us listen gird yourselves with humility He's telling you, like, put on humility like you're putting on your battle belt, like you're putting on your go-to-war belt, when you're putting on your kit and your body armor. Like, put on humility because, understand, humility is a form of our armor. A humility is the form of our literal defense shield against the adversary's tactics and the fiery arrows of pride, the fiery arrows of bitterness and wrath and hatred and envy and all those bullets that the enemy is going to be shooting off at you, right? When he's firing off all of his rounds at you, humility is literally part of your armor. Listen to this. For Elohim resists the proud, but gives favor to the humble. Right now, what does giving favor look like? How does that actually apply into our lives? When we get favor, this is literally what Yahuwah gave to Joseph as his weapon to sustain Joseph when he's thrown into a, literally when he's human trafficked multiple times into multiple countries. He's an international, like human trafficking, child trafficking. It's like Joseph's story. That's literally his story. Those of you who have experienced that stuff, listen, that's where I found so much, so much satisfaction in reading his story was seeing the rec like the, the reclamation of a life from someone who was trafficked like he understood y'all gave him favor amidst circumstances that were impossible and because of that man that favor gave him the ability to become in charge of all of these duties in potiphar's house then later on when he's thrown into prison false accusations terrible stuff he is later delivered unto a jailkeeper who's like listen i'm going to promote you to have you run the entire prison house Right? That was favor that Yahweh gave him. But that's because Joseph was literally clothed with humility. From the beginning of this story, when he is thrown into that pit and to the end of it, you see him girding himself with humility. You see this with David, even though he is exalted to be king, like exalted to be king. You see him girding himself with humility in the presence of Saul, in the presence of Jonathan. You see him girding himself in the presence of Samuel, even in front of the mighty men that are like, with him he guards himself with humility and because of that yahuwah gives him favor like a shield grace right chen is the hebrew word for it at noon he literally builds a shield around him with favor and so these are like how he protects us out there in a world that's filled with all the minds right the snares of the devil the snares of these immortals this is the way that he shields us and protects us listen but there's some components here that we can't lose sight of Humble yourselves then under the mighty hand of Elohim so that he exalts you in due time, casting all your worry upon him, for he is concerned about you. Be sober, watch, guard, because your adversary, the devil, 
walks around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in the belief, knowing that the same hardships are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And the Elohim of all favor, who called you to his everlasting esteem by Messiah Yeshua, after you have suffered a while, himself perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the esteem and the might forever and ever. You see this? As we submit ourselves to him, as we surrender our life, our dreams, our desires, our hopes, everything we ever longed for to him, as we do that, right? We give him our worries. We give him our fears because he cares for us. He can exalt us in the moment that he chooses. He can lift us up. He can establish us and build us up with a firm foundation so that we can endure those ever-seeking enemies that are out there like a seek and destroy. You want to know what's crazy? I'm going to teach you guys something. Let me show you this. I'm going to talk about the F-35 Lightning fighter jet for a second here. Bear with me here. Mm. That is unbelievably good. Wow, it's like actually a latte. Way to go, turmeric tea. Holy smokes, that is so good. <laughs> I've got electricity in my bones. You ready for this, you guys? Let's talk about this ridiculous thing. The ALE-50 toad decoy. I'm going to show you guys this because it'll have a great, great visual to go along with this one. If you guys don't know, I have a ridiculously strong affinity for aircraft, fighter aircraft in particular. I'm just like shockingly biased towards them. They're fascinating. Let me show you this sucker. You ready? Watch this guy. Okay. It's F-35. Has uh, It's like our advanced fifth generation stealth aircraft fighter jet. We've shaved this out with some of our uh, allies for death. You know, the other people that are in the covenant with death in the United States military, the Brits, those kinds of folks. You know what I'm talking about, you guys. I love you all. I know you got a job to do. Check this out. All right, this is it. This is called the ALE-55 decoy system. Okay. Now, you see most of these aircraft that carry these as like a defensive measure. When you've got missiles that get shot at an aircraft, right? They're like, oh, no, some guy's coming to try to blow us up or kill a bunch of people. They're like, well, let's fire off our anti-aircraft right? missiles, right? So say they're like heat-seeking. Some of them are heat-seeking. Some of them are seeking the, them through radar signatures, right? Stealth aircraft's like fundamental job is to try to not be detected, right? This is a B-1 Lancer over here, this guy. It's a fighter. Not, oh, sorry, a bomber. Bomber. Super fast guy. Really speedy. These over here are fighter jets, right? They're smaller ones. This is like an F-16 fighting Falcon. And we have an F-18 portrayed here. Now, the F-35, though, drags these things out. These things are carried externally on these other types of aircraft. Stealth aircraft, they don't carry munitions really on the outside. They carry them on the inside. Really sneaky stuff. What this thing does, though, this is crazy. It's got a few different options here for how to like handle what's going down here. So the first thing is, is like when it, something comes at it, they can deploy it out the side of it and it's dragged. It's on literally like a tethered line, like a little tethered line comes shooting out of the back of this thing. And so then it goes flying. There's, that's actually a better size one right there. That's more what it looks like. Like the F-35 carries four of these bad boys. So it can literally deflect and fight off potentially four active threats that are coming against it against amidst other like chaff and flares and traditional methods. This is something that actively engages the missile system. So the first tactic it has is jamming that sucker up. It's like a missile gets fired at it and it's trying to use its radar to find the play. So it's going to try to attack it with signals warfare. He's, he's just going to just try to murder it with signals and just disrupt it, right? Try to get it to, to go away. If that doesn't work, it's got a second tactic, which is spoofing. Okay. And it will literally make signatures that appear to be like different planes. Like, so if the radar signature of the F-35 or the F-16 in this case, it might make it look way bigger. It might make it look huge. Like, oh, we're actually like a B-2, right? We're the size of a, a B-52. So, you know, we're like, we're a big, big, big thing. It can make it look like different aircraft or different things to confuse it and potentially make the missile go somewhere else and blow up over there, right? It's got a third tactic, which is called deflection, right? And this is where it's literally... So then when you get into that deflection zone, so that's like after you absolutely have a lock on, it will try to attack that little lock with multiple different frequencies to try to really throw it off completely. But then it has this last tactic, which is called seduction. And literally what this, this system is going to do is it's going to try to imitate the aircraft's radar signature, and the pilot can literally de detach that line and so that the missile itself will get pulled away from it 
and it will get detonated, hit it, right? It literally will try to become the aircraft to the missile that's coming in to destroy it so that it, the decoy itself gets shot and explodes rather than the aircraft, right? So, oh, there it is. Let me just show you right there. Bam. These are some of these, uh, this is, I'm almost certain that's the F-35 right there. But these are these little bay doors where these things open up. And they've got four of them on the sides of this thing that open up and deploy these things as they're flying along in here. Oh, there you go right there. Bam. See, look at these sneaky little doors. <laughs> Come on, look at all these. Okay, these are all different panels that open up with all kinds of goodie bags waiting to rain out of the sky like nightmares of the wind. This one right here, different doors that open up and allow these things to deploy out of the sides of the aircraft. It's just a wild piece of engineering. I mean, we can make stuff like this. Come on. This is like decades old stuff. I mean, really decades old stuff that they're using along with these things. Now yeah, they're showing you all of it. Anyways, this is literally when I think about like how, when I think about how the enemy comes in and attacks us, like I literally think of him shooting those fiery missiles. Those are literally missiles coming at us. It's like the enemy has detected us in his territory and he's like fire the missiles at him you got to deploy that ale 55 you're like get that thing out of here get the decoys out of here like this is for me how spiritual warfare looks in my head you know if i was going to write a book about it like an action series this is what would be going on inside it we'd be popping chaff and rolling high and banging hard and you're like get out of there that's how it looks i think in the spiritual realm it's just a lot more boring to our heads when we read the bible and we're like and your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour resist him i'm like are you kidding me what a ferociously intense, terrifying story. That's why I want I want to literally get in a pit with a lion and just wrestle him so you guys get an idea of what that looks like. You're like, oh, my gosh. Nathan climbed into a pit with a lion and just fought it. Yeah. I want you guys to understand, like, it's a visceral, physical war that we fight. It's not just something that happens in our minds. Like, these are real strategies of how to fight back against this war of the ages we are locked into combat every single day and night whether we perceive it or not there's a literal war going on just outside of our physical eyes now that stuff does come and kick down our doors at times and it makes it unbelievably obvious at other times but here are the strategies that the father gave us preserved in his word so that we could eat these things and mature and grow and sustain right like in the very beginning of first peter he literally says oh man check this out having oh chapter two having put aside then all evil and all deceit and hypocrisies and envyings and all evil words as newborn babes desire the unadulterated milk of the word in order that you grow by it if indeed you have tasted that the master is good drawing near to him a living stone rejected indeed by men but chosen by elohim and as precious you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house a set apart priesthood to offer spiritual slaughter offerings acceptable to elohim, elohim through yeshua messiah oh this is good because it is contained in the scripture see i lay in zion a chief cornerstone chosen precious and he who believes on him shall by no means be put to shame this preciousness then is for you who believe but to those is but to those who are disobedient the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock that makes for falling who stumble because they are disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed there's a phrase that's used in there which is not found many other places for a reason it says the stone which the builders rejected so the question is who are the builders right this is when all those secret societies should start popping into your mind like we talk about the freemasons one of one of the characters of the agents of evil right these are stonemasons they're builders they literally were called the builders he's talking about they rejected the chief cornerstone this is why when you see George Washington laying the cornerstone at the, the Capitol building, when they're building the pantheons for all the gods to sit in Washington, D.C., under the District of Columbia, right? That that in his Masonic apron, they're laying the cornerstone. The cornerstone that they, they rejected, they reject, is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua the Messiah. They reject him, and they embrace Nimrod. They embrace Nimrod as the chief cornerstone. They embrace the light bearer as Halel ben Shahar, Lucifer, 
right? That's the one. They reject the true bringer of light and truth and wisdom and authority. They reject him and they embrace a different one. That's who he's talking about here. It's because they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. They, you're forbidden from swearings, oaths, and allegiances, and bowing down to these other mighty ones, from clothing yourself with iniquity. You are you are forbidden from entering into these agreements, these covenants with these other gods. But they reject that. They're disobedient to that commandment, that instruction, and they instead embrace a following after the covenant of men and the covenant of the immortals, the rebels. That's why they're blinded to it. That's why it's a stumbling block to them. That's why they can't receive it because they have gone into a covenant with the God of this age. And by doing so, they're susceptible to his influence and they become his agents on this earth. That's their job. And so they're bound up in iniquity. They're bound up in this iniquity force that they cannot get out of. They cannot escape from. They need deliverance from it because they literally are in prey. They're in, they are the ones joining up the adversary to go and war against us. Dr. Michael Lake here has a, a note on this. I want to jump into about the armor. That was so good. It's because he, uh, This is, by the way, we're going to just jump back to the Sharith Imperative for a moment. This is the book, Dr. Michael Lake, The Sharith Imperative, Empowering the Remnant to Overcome the Gates of Hell. You get it. The book, let's just go over here. The Realities of the Battle. This is in page 310. In uh, the preacher's sermon, this is a, yep. Yeah. In the preacher's sermon and outline Bible, we discover some powerful insight to Paul's instruction in Ephesians 6, Spiritual Warfare. There is the charge to the Christian soldier. Note the word brothers. It is Christian brothers who need the charge, not the world. Christian believers must diligently heed what is about to be said. There is no other way to conquer the enemies who stand so violently opposed to the Christian believer. Unless the believer heeds the charge and message of this passage, he will cave into temptation and sin and end up walking through life just as most men do. We can never forget that they, these enemies are violently opposed to the ways of righteousness. They are violently committed to rooting out the convicted, those who have conviction. They are 100% committed to rooting them out, and they're willing to do whatever it takes in order to bring that to pass. These are literally some of the fruits of what it's like when we are not walking through life in the armor that we are supposed to have. We are not experiencing the abundance and joy of life not experiencing the power and deliverance, care and concern, the love and fellowship of God's daily presence, being uncertain and unsure of the future, not having the confidence of being acceptable to God, not being assured of living forever with God. A believer must heed what God says in this passage. He must do exactly what God says in order to conquer the great enemies of life. The charge is twofold. The believer must be strong in Yahuwah and in the power of his might. Note the stress upon the power and the strength. Three different words are used. This is Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in Yahuwah and in the power of his might. These are the three different words that are used. Be strong in Yahuwah's power and in Yahuwah's might. Each of these words is, to use, is used to stress the utter necessity of the believer being strong and possessing power. The word strong, ened, endunamu, means power, might, and strength. The believer must possess power, might, and strength as he walks through the course of this life. Yahuwah's power, or kratos, means his sovereign, unlimited power and dominion over all. Yahuwah's might, eskuios, means strength, force, ability. It means his ability to use his strength and force wisely. That is in perfection. The believer is to be strong in the sovereign, unlimited power of Yahuwah, in the power of his might, in his ability to use his power as exactly as it should be. But note the critical point. The believer is not human, fleshly strength. The, or, sorry, the believer's strength is not human, fleshly strength. It's not the strength of anything within this world. The believer's strength is found in Yahuwah, in a living, dynamic relationship with him. Yahuwah is the source of the believer's strength. There's no other source that can give man the strength to overcome this world with all its trials and temptations and death. 
what we must note at this point in our discussion is that the only way we can be strong in Yahuwah and the power of his might is through putting on Christ, the new man. In contrast, the old man resonates with the power of the iniquity force. Therefore, the old man is under the subjection of the enemies Paul details for us. We cannot oppose an enemy while flowing in what fuels their kingdom. That is why Paul returns to the truth of putting on the armor. Put on the whole armor of Elohim that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Remember, this apostle of the Gentiles had already stressed the need to put on the old, put off the old man. To attempt to enter this battle while remaining in the old man would be foolhardy. Now you are beginning to realize the state of spiritual warfare in the 21st century. Putting on our armor is putting on Christ. Jesus is the perfect example of biblical holiness when the mystery of godliness displaces the mystery of iniquity within. The believer dis will discover that he is armed to the teeth to wage war against the trifecta of hell. This is the full armor, okay? We have offensive and defensive measures, right? The F-35 Lightning's carrying inside those bomb bay doors, right? He's got missiles for fighting and air-to-air -air combat. He also has ones that he can drop down for air-to-surface combat, right? He can, he can deploy a variety of offensive and defensive measures to make him highly capable of entering into an enemy-occupied territory undetected. And even if he has to engage, he's ready and, and capable to do so across any measure. We are supposed to be wholly minded, capable of standing in a defensive posture when we need to, and capable of bringing an offensive nature when we need to. Because we have to learn that we, this kingdom of heaven, kingdom of Yahuwah, suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. This is a violent, knockdown, drag out, war, fight to the death. Every one of us is locked in here. And if we don't have the mentality of a soldier, if we don't have the, the commitment, the all-in resolution in our mind that we are committed to this thing to the bitter end. We are going to lose. We're going to lose bad because you must understand something. We have to have that mindset. We need to be ready to engage. Keep, be, always be ready to give an answer. Let's go back to that one. That's in the same book, man. This book's so good. Come on. You ready for this? First Peter 3. Hmm. Check this out. In the same, oh, let's just go back. Right. To sum up, verse 8. To sum up, let all of you be like minded, sympathetic, loving as brothers, tender hearted, humble minded, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this in order to inherit a blessing. For he who wishes to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Because the eyes of Yahuwah are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of Yahuwah is against those who do evil. And who is the one doing evil to you? If you become imitators of the good. But even if you suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed and do not fear their threats. Neither be troubled, but set apart Yahuwah Elohim in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer to everyone asking you a reason concerning the expectation that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience so that when they speak against you as doers of evil, those who falsely accuse your, accuse your good behavior in Messiah shall be ashamed. For it is better if it is the desire of Elohim to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Because even Messiah once suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to Elohim, having been put to death indeed in flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and proclaimed unto the spirits in prison. See this? Oftentimes I was raised with this snippet theology of always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. And I was like, yes, defend the faith. And we should. However, if you, begin, if you, if you neglect the very beginning part of that verse, but set apart Yahuwah Elohim in your hearts. That's the beginning of it. First things first, priorities, is to set him apart. 
holy. He's holy in our hearts, right? Give him the ground, the territory, and the sovereignty in our hearts. We surrender our self-sovereignty to him when we enter into our covenant. We say, you know what? I believe you made me. I believe you have a purpose and a calling for my life. Like, I sincerely believe you know what's best for my life. You know more than I do. I don't want to submit myself to you and to trust your ways are better than my ways. That I would surrender to you my will, my life, all that I am. I believe that your son is who he says he is, that he is the son of righteousness, the son of Elohim, that he came in the flesh, that he died and was raised to life. And I believe in the name of Yeshua. Like, I believe you can transform me and make me like him, that you can fill me with the dynamite power of your set apart spirit and give me the tools, the weaponry I need to be able to destroy the old man and to become new in your kingdom, that I want to be in a covenant with you and a relationship with you where you provide for me, where you protect me and where I serve you and I become your bond servant, your co-laborer on this earth, right? That's setting him apart in your heart. Then as you learn your identity, you learn his story, you learn the testimony, you learn how to give an answer to people to ask you, why do you believe what you believe? Why are you the way you are? Why do you not go after us and do the same things? Like it says in here, like when you start forsaking the ways of the world, you know, Verse four, chapter four, it says, therefore, since Messiah suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. He's telling you that the mind of Messiah is a weapon. Don't ever forget it. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so that he no longer lives the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but according to the desire of Elohim. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the desires of the nations having walked in indecencies, lusts, drunkenness, orgies, wild parties, and abominable idolatries, in which they are surprised that you do not run with them in the same flood of loose behavior, blaspheming, who shall give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the good news was also brought to those that are dead, so that whereas they are judged according to men in the flesh, they might live according to the Elohim in the spirit. But the end of all is drawn near. Therefore, be sober-minded and attentive in those prayers. Man, see that? There's some preaching going on there, like preaching. It even says in here right there, the back of that verse 19 of chapter 3, it's like, in whom, in which he also went and proclaimed unto the spirits in prison. He's talking about those immortals. He's literally talking about those immortals that were bound in chains of darkness into the earth in Tartarus, right? That's He literally went down there and preached to them. He told him testimony. He's like, I can't, I win. Keys of death, like jingling. He's all like, jingling, ling, ling. I win. That's so awesome. It says he heralded, triumphed over them in victory, right? He preached the truth to them who were held in their bondage because of their deception. It's an all out cosmic war, you guys. And our Messiah has given us these words so that we might live by them. But you know what? There's an adversary always trying to advertise. He's always got his pretty little marketing teams out there making the other side look so good, making it look so good. And he's calling us and inviting us to come and join him all the time. But you know what? Yahuwah, his people should be calling and inviting people to come and join that team. We should be the ones that are better at advertising. We should be way better at marketing our life. And it's through our good works. It's through our fruitfulness, our good fruits, that people are able to see the evidence of the kingdom that we serve in. And as we do that, man, become a powerhouse team for the kingdom of righteousness. Anyways, you guys, I got to go. I love you all so much. I hope you live in an absolutely dangerous and exciting and exhilarating life out there. I pray that doors of opportunity would be open to you so you can bring the gospel, this good news to the nations. Pray also that we would have an opportunity to go and witness to the nations and all those that Yahuwah would appoint to us. I pray that there would be divine appointments opened up in your life and you guys would be able to be bold and courageous for the kingdom of righteousness sake. I love you all. I'll talk to you soon.